thank you all for joining us. Uh, so we'll dive right into this. Um, I'll start with Audrey. You know, for much of the 2010s, it seemed like a lot of people on the left really wanted the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court to get involved on redistricting as a way to act against gerrymandering, you know, as we saw decades earlier with the Warren Court. But now with them having victories on the state Supreme Court level, it seems that there's more, at least to some degree, people on the right who want the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved. Is this all politics or is there some sort of legal or policy consistent principle? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very good question. I don't think we have found a way to take politics out of redistricting yet. Um, even the independent redistricting commissions can be influenced by politics. We've seen that. And, and certainly the post redistricting litigation is influenced by politics. Um, so of course, some politics leaks through the decisions to bring cases to court and which court you bring your decisions to on both sides. Those challenging how the lines are drawn would have pretty poor lawyers if they didn't take into consideration where they think their clients are most likely to win. Um, I don't think you necessarily can generalize too much from individual cases or you know what candidates and officials who bring them up, people wanna win. That's how our legal system is structured. It is what it is. So, you know, who was bringing these cases and which court they bring them to, I don't take much stock in that regarding overall policy perspective of the political parties. That's just kind of how it works. But um, the courts on the other side, I think looking at what happens there, that's a different question. Whether the courts are applying consistent principles in these cases, that goes to, you know, judicial philosophy, more than partisan politics. And I would say it's too early to tell here. The state courts clearly are very different in how they're dealing with these cases, but it's hard to compare apples to apples there because the state constitutions and the state laws are very different from one another. Um, and this trend of bringing these cases so much to state courts is fairly new. Uh, as far as the Supreme Court goes, I think it's also a little early to be looking at this for this cycle. They just decided Rucho last year, and so far they haven't issued any you know, big opinions on redistricting other than on the emergency docket. And there's just not a lot to go on there. So I think we've got to wait a little bit, have a couple elections, and then and then maybe that, that we can revisit that question. Yeah, it's an excellent point, especially of all the new developments we've seen. And um, Professor Brown, yeah, um, in Ohio, we've certainly seen a lot of that play out. Uh, do you have uh, further thoughts? Um, Ohio is a mess, and I think Ohio is the um, uh, the counterexample to everything that Audrey said. I think Ohio proves to us that uh, whether we're dealing with federal courts or, or state courts, that uh, politics is king, and um, it's not so much a matter of judicial philosophy. Um, it's just I, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, we um, at one point had you know hope that these um, commissions or, or at least the courts would be able to um, to jump in on redistricting and offer some kind of solution, a better solution than uh, than state legislatures that we already know are um, politically influenced. But it just in Ohio, it just hasn't happened. Yeah, certainly. And you know, if there's another um, Midwest state that's been pretty big this cycle, I'd say it has been Wisconsin where uh, Kevin... Um, you are. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, first, I mean, I want to echo what Audrey said in terms of, you know, you can't ex look at the behavior of litigants to draw a principle um, because litigants, they they sit where they stand or they stand where they sit. You know, their job ultimately is to try to achieve the result that they want in that particular case. You wouldn't say there's inconsistency about, uh, say, social security policy if somebody publicly advocates raising the age for full vesting to 70, but that doesn't happen. And when they become 67 years old, they end up, you know, taking their social security benefits. But I do think that the question asked whether there, you know, ultimately is some kind of policy inconsistencies or consistencies when it comes to whether state or federal courts uh, might get involved. And, you know, I, I think that uh, ultimately when you look back on uh, the Warren Court, and you look uh, at federal courts getting involved uh, in the first place, the objections that were raised 
uh, to justiciability, they, they weren't just federalism objections. They were also separation of powers objections. And I think in Mark's comments, you heard concerns about courts acting politically, and they're still there. But when I think when you take down that first tier, that first tier question of whether courts should be involved in this at all, there are subsidiary questions that come up. And they've come up in cases this term. For example, well, the question might be justiciable, but how does a court go about issuing a remedy? What are the confines of the court's equitable powers? And as a matter of principle, one might say, well, you know, federalism is a fundamental principle, but the separation of powers is also a fundamental principle. So as you sort of tear back or you play on different playing fields with each of those first questions, how people sort through, how parties sort through, how advocacy organizations sort through, how they want courts to address those other fundamental questions, um, and whether they give a pr a priority to federalist concerns or separation of power concerns or concern about courts acting in a political fashion, or the substantive concerns that underlie these cases, uh, such as equal protection. You know, I, I wouldn't say that that's inconsistent. I, I just think that those are very difficult questions uh, ultimately, uh, and how it shakes out depends largely on what decisions uh, have preceded uh, the situation that you're in. Yeah, those are fascinating points. Um, Walter, what do you think? Well, I think Audrey and Kevin have um, made the points more elegantly than I would. You, I do not expect consistency from litigants, especially when they are parties or candidates. Uh, where we might hope for consistency is from the intellectuals and professors who write about the area. And I would argue uh, with Kevin that there has been some general consistency. Uh, there is a camp that is more suspicious of the court's ability to get things right. It has been echoed by um, Chief Justice Roberts and his majority um, on questions like uh, would it open floodgates to create a federal remedy? Um, would courts all come out the same way if there were a federal remedy? And uh, and likewise with those who are more optimistic about those sorts of things, like Justice Kagan. Um, so uh, again, when you turn to the judges, the uh, those who are learned in the law, uh, it's not just all politics. There, there are uh, positions that people stick to and um, sometimes persuade their colleagues. Professor um, Pildes, you're a professor and have written a lot about this. Uh, so um, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think, first of all, it's important to recognize that um, these cases uh, are not just brought by the political parties or the candidates. Uh, so, for example, I actually was part of a legal team representing Common Cause in the Common Cause versus Rucho case that was before the Supreme Court, uh, where Common Cause was trying to get the court to strike down North Carolina's partisan gerrymander. The League of Women Voters um, have also been a significant player in a lot of these partisan gerrymandering cases. Um, so that's just a, a first qualification. Um, for, as for myself, I have for 30 years thought that partisan gerrymandering is a sort of pathological practice in American politics. Uh, no other country which has election districts allows self-interested politicians to draw their own districts or the districts for their partisan allies. Um, and uh, I do think there are many academics who have been consistent uh, about this issue uh, over the years. Um, I also don't think there's the inconsistency exactly that some people are describing here or the quite the political spin on this in the courts that, that some of this description might suggest. So, for example, uh, the Republican majority Ohio Supreme Court applying a constitutional amendment that voters adopted that banned partisan gerrymandering, the Ohio Supreme Court has consistently in this cycle struck down Republican gerrymanders uh, of uh, the districts in Ohio. Uh, the New York uh, courts here in my state, uh, a, a court that is, uh, has justices appointed uh, consistently by Democratic governors, uh, just struck down the Democratic gerrymander in New York. Um, many people predicted that wouldn't happen precisely because the court was a, a completely democratically appointed court. Uh, and so I think you are seeing uh, in the states uh, a more optimistic pattern uh, than some of this discussion uh, might suggest. Uh, I also think there's not quite the inconsistency uh, that you raised at the beginning between 
um, not wanting the Supreme Court. Well, let me back up. Let me start this sentence again. Um, in the partisan gerrymandering cases, uh, that were brought in the 2010 round of redistricting, you know, the plaintiffs were trying to strike down partisan gerrymanders. In the cases that the Republican side of the spectrum is trying to take to the Supreme Court now under this independent state legislature doctrine, what's happening is you have state courts striking down partisan gerrymanders. And it's the effort to overturn that. So, I mean, consistently, those of us who think partisan gerrymandering is a scourge on American democracy um, have supported constitutional amendments in states to ban it or to take the practice out of the hands of politicians and put it in the hands of commissions. Um, I try very hard to get the federal courts to come in and strike down partisan gerrymanders. They didn't. But when state Supreme Courts strike down partisan gerrymanders, I'm certainly in favor of that. Uh, and I do not want the Supreme Court to get involved in overturning uh, state Supreme Courts, applying voter adopted amendments, banning partisan gerrymandering uh, from then uh, uh, overturning those on the basis that the Constitution somehow precludes voters from banning partisan gerrymandering and state courts from enforcing those bans. So a follow up to that, do you, um, while New York and uh, arguably Maryland, you know, kind of went counter to what people expected, you know, on um, and Grant's just Twitter, but uh, like on election Twitter, I saw someone go, oh, well, Ohio, we're going to get a real conservative justice in next cycle. It seems like in a lot of ways, Republicans were kind of caught sleeping with some of these Supreme Court races, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, a little bit Ohio, and now they're woken up. Um, so if they can win, especially with some of the races, you know, 2022, for now at least, you know, going to be a good Republican year, um, will we kind of see the end of some of those decisions potentially? Well, there's, there's no question that the polarized political environment we're in is certainly um, extending to the courts, uh, particularly state courts uh, where judges are uh, elected. Um, so there's no question that, that the, the money flowing into state judicial elections is increasing tremendously. Um, and certainly these cases do have you know, dramatic political ramifications and the political parties are undoubtedly uh, going to fight to try to get uh, justices they think are likely to be supportive in these kinds of cases appointed to the court. Now, what those judges will do when they're actually on the court uh, is not necessarily so uh, predictable. As I say, you know, we now have um, some uh, optimistic experiences with judges of either party uh, being willing to strike down gerrymanders uh, when the state constitutions prohibit it. Uh, even if those gerrymanders have been adopted by um, the legislature dominated by the party that that justice is associated with. Um, but there's no question the politics around judicial uh, elections are, are getting far more intense, far more polarized. Um, and these decisions probably, you know, do contribute to that to some extent, certainly in Ohio, if that's the case. Oh, fascinating. Now, uh, going to Professor Brown, you know, we've talked a lot about these uh, state versus uh, Supreme Court decisions, but one um, that was kind of a bit of a big decision this cycle was the Alabama decision, where the Alabama decision case, which came through federal court, not the state Supreme Court, struck down, um, struck down the redistricting map. And then the Supreme Court used, issued an emergency ruling of what a lot of people call the shadow docket. And um, a somewhat similar situation occurred with, um, where, um, as with the U.S. Supreme Court overruling the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. So many are concerned that the U.S.'s um, Supreme Court is getting involved in a lot of issues um, democracy through a non-transparent manner, and while others have noted that these decisions have to come quickly due to the midterm elections. So with that in mind, is there a legal and or policy defense for the way that the Supreme Court has issued these two decisions on redistricting you know, through the shadow docket? And could we see the Supreme Court, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, 
using or this process for electoral uh, issues and cases? Well, I certainly see that happening. I just I'd like to speak just one second to what Rick said about Ohio. I think um, I'm not nearly as optimistic as Rick is about what happened in Ohio. But basically, we had one um, state Supreme Court justice, the Chief Justice, who's term limited. Uh, not term limited. She's age limited. She's not. She can't run for re appointment, a re-election. She's the only um, crossover at all, period, um, in in the mess of Ohio. The other three Republicans dissented vehemently, I mean, with nasty language, but pointing figures and calling the, uh, uh, the majority rogue and dishonest and in for a power grab. And, um, and then the, the three who joined the chief justice um, were Democrats. And then in the federal court, the same thing happened. We had a three-judge federal court, the two Trump appointments, uh, um, surprisingly, shockingly, in my estimation, forced a, an illegal map on Ohio, which is exactly what the Republicans wanted. The dissent was a Democrat. So that's, uh, long story short, that's lining up along party lines pretty consistently. So I, I think Ohio is not cause for optimism at all in what courts can do in terms of um, re resolving gerrymandering problems. And, the, and now you inject the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, yeah, I, I just see the U.S. Supreme Court making matters worse. I, I do share Rick's aversion to using the U.S. Supreme Court for any of this stuff. Uh, the, what happened in Alabama was um, quite, um, well, I'm not surprising because, you know, I'm not naive. I can count the Republicans on the court and the Democrats on the court and anticipate what's going to happen there. But in terms of neutral principles, quite shocking that the Supreme Court would have intervened in the Alabama case and, and said, you got to use the old map, even though Alabama violated the, um, the Voting Rights Act. And then you see the same thing in Wisconsin and other surprising, um, applying neutral principles. I mean, again, I'm not naive. And then and just to use Ohio again, I mean, so you got the League of Women Voters involved in both the Ohio Supreme Court and the, um, the federal court. And what, what are they doing? Are they taking the case to the U.S. Supreme Court? No, because they're not, um, they're not naive. They, they, they know if they took the case, and they could, they'd have a right of appeal under the three-judge uh, federal district court order. Um, they're, they're not going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court because they know exactly what would happen there. Um, so it's, again, I'm just a little bit more skeptical, I guess, than others who, who think that state courts, you know, are good and will solve this problem. And, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court's right about staying out of it. The U.S. Supreme Court's not going to stay out of it. Uh, they're going to jump in with this crazy independent legislature theory um, shortly. Um, and they're going to start striking down what state Supreme Courts have done with gerrymandering. So I... I I just don't think judges are apolitical. That's my take on it right now. I would predict, by the way, that uh, the, this independent state legislature doctrine in the extreme form that uh, Professor Braun was just describing it is not actually going to have five votes at the Supreme Court. It's uh, it's just too far out there. I'm, it's just a personal prediction. I don't think it's got five or even four votes. But, um, but it raises a point that I, it, we might want to explain for um, viewers who are a little new to this, which is when it comes to race and redistricting, um, the courts don't really have the option of staying out. The Voting Rights Act requires them to, to participate. The, the 15th Amendment requires them to participate. So there isn't really the option of abstention. And you can criticize the way in which they intervene, but um, not involving themselves in charges of racial discrimination and redistricting is not an option for them. And here you have a fairly longstanding uh, conservative liberal or Republican Democrat split on how to apply principles of racial neutrality. Um, you know, that is going to affect some of these cases. I do think it's a sincere difference. Um, at, but it is a reason in our minds to always treat race as basically its own category because they have to play by different roles on it. That's really interesting. And uh, um, do you think that there could be, um, I, this, yeah, speaking long, long term, but more votes down the row. Of course, it is um, depends on who gets a um, who gets to appoint future Supreme Court justices. But I guess my question is like the people being appointed district or um, appellate by um, either Trump last term or whoever 
you know, and whenever the next Republican president is, do you think a lot of their judicial nominees are going to subscribe to that theory? I'll, I'll jump back in. I um, I think despite the instance or two, which were pointed out a couple minutes ago uh, of federal courts, the overall record in the past few years of the federal judiciary has been very admirable as far as uh, Republican and Trump appointed judges not um, uh, taking the bait when asked to save um, uh, certain Republican interests. We certainly saw that in the um, post-election litigation. Uh, and again, state courts and federal courts, very different political background. We've seen some um, admirable action from state courts. Uh, and I would throw in Maryland there where uh, a judge who was appointed by a Democratic governor and whose entire career had been associated with the Democratic Party was the one who struck down the Democratic gerrymander. Uh, it's only one judge, but boy, is that ever uh, independent and admirable of her. And uh, even so, uh, s- state court judges in many states are elected uh, after having to campaign, sometimes in partisan campaigns. They're just subject to many more political pressures. It's sad but true. And so even though I'll take whatever victories can be gotten for fairness from state courts, uh, I don't feel uh, as confident in counting on it. The the federal courts, I know this is going on in a limb, but the federal courts are really one of the most uh, uncorrupted institutions we have left. And I um, think that with exceptions here and there, but they are, um, uh, you know, going to probably go on setting a better standard, taking one court with another. Yeah. Can I jump in? I just, I don't think like Walter says, I don't think we can really criticize the Supreme court for issuing emergency opinions on these issues. Um, I clearly in some cases it's seemed to make more sense than others, but they're getting so many requests these days that they are required to act on. Um, and to, to be honest, there hasn't been a lot of time at this point for them to deal with, these cases and some of these issues in a more thorough manner. The census was late, made the maps late, the elections are soon. So, I mean, of course, this is happening right now in the primary election season. And, and I think it's it, we really have to remember this is a snapshot in time um, regarding this. And a few more years and a few more election cycles are going to give us a better perspective of the overall themes here. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, excellent points. Uh, before we go on the next question, I want to give uh, Kevin a chance to jump in. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to address the the question about the so-called shadow docket. You know, full disclosure, I think I've got a bias here because I um, represented the Wisconsin legislature uh, in that appeal to the United States Supreme Court this term. The counsel of record was Taylor Meehan and, and uh, Adam Mortar was another co-counsel uh, on that case. Um, but I think there's absolutely uh, a legal and policy defense to the court getting involved in the emergency docket. Some court is making a decision that's affecting the nuts and bolts about how elections are going to be conducted. And I think that every time a court, especially in the modern era, makes that decision, it's going to affect at least one election cycle potentially more before a a full appeals process could take place. And I think that the Supreme Court has to have some mechanism to reverse what it believes to be clear wrongs or even to hold the brakes. And what I mean by hold the brakes is we can speculate as to what the court is going to do in Alabama. I don't believe that the Alabama District Court decision is a straightforward application of the Voting Rights Act. I think it completely ignored what are the very significant equal protection concerns uh, that come from maximizing the number of racial districts um, in uh, the the number of of racial districts, just because you mathematically can. I think that uh, that kind of argument's completely foreclosed by Johnson versus DeGrande. So maybe the court sees this as a clear air issue, but, but maybe what it's saying is, hey, this is sort of a new way that courts are looking at this. And the air cost of a court um, setting the rules for how an election is going to be conducted is greater than not immediately remedying uh, a legislature's mistake 
when it promulgated a new district, or at least I think that there's a really good argument to be made uh, that that's how things balance out. Because whenever courts are getting involved in redistricting, they have to proceed with uh, all deliberate caution because because redistricting is a responsibility ultimately that most states uh, vest in their state legislatures and those that don't uh, vest in a, in a state uh, agency like a commission. Um, and inherent in, well the, well, the question of justiciability was answered a long time ago, the issues that concern courts about justiciability are going to continue and they still exist, even though well, we got over the hurdle and we'll hear these cases, the courts still need to be pretty sensitive uh, to not being too intertwined with the political thicket. And with with uh, Walters, to Walters' point, I think that the court, at least the Rehnquist and the Roberts courts have been very consistent about um, a, a concern about entering too much into this fray. Um, a second point I want to make about about the so-called shadow docket is I, I think it's a really, really unhelpful term that ironically obscures what's actually going on. You know, it is an emergency docket. All courts have them. All appellate courts have them. It's how executions get stayed. It's how any emergency gets to the court. It's the only mechanism to exercise supervisory co- uh, power really over in real time over uh, district courts or, or state courts that have, that have uh, committed errors. And it's not a shadowy process. I mean, in, in Wisconsin, there were hundreds of pages of briefs that were submitted to the court. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of amicus that participated in the case. Wisconsin's case is a little different than Alabama. And so far, the court wrote an opinion um, with its order. And so the public knows what the court was thinking um, about the matter. But in Alabama, you know, that case is going to get heard on the merits and we're going to see exactly what the court was thinking. The only thing that we don't know um, through the shadow docket, um, the, the criticism of the shadow docket, is we don't know the court's rationale for, you know, saying stop um, and getting involved at that time. But, you know, the fact is, is that the Supreme Court does a lot of stuff that we don't know like that. I mean, there's no opinions that accompany denials for cert. There's no opinions that say this is why we granted cert to this case. I mean, every once in a while you'll glean that. Um, you know, you can look at the rules and you can look at the briefs and you can figure out why that happened. But the same is true um, on the on the emergency docket. And the final point to make here is that to the extent that there's something shadowy uh, about the processes dealing with with the uh, with redistricting, I think that there should be a lot more concern or more attention um, drawn to the the fact that litigation and litigation gamesmanship itself um, is something that's clandestine, something that we don't know about, something that the public doesn't have any control or access to. When a party challenges a law, a duly enacted law, um, a redistricting law, we, we don't know, you know, they, they don't represent any kind of public interest when they propose a remedial map or something like that, other than this self-declared uh, interest. And, and we should wonder about why it is that we have uh, almost litigation privilege uh, to be able to have this outsized role uh, in what what maps look like. Um, and to the extent that there's a concern about the speed in which the court operates, I mean, I think that redistricting litigation as a whole is something that doesn't necessarily look like other litigation. Timelines get compressed. The same experts exist all over the country, and they're all asked to participate in cases at the exact same time. You know, uh, there are concerns that are legitimate about whether or not, you know, you can act with speed without undermining accuracy. But I don't think that those concerns um, uh, are to be exclusively uh, leveled at the Supreme Court. And I think that actually the Supreme Court does a remarkable job. They are very, they're comprised of very fine lawyers uh, and they are w- well equipped to handle those cases. Uh, but the concern, it's its one that should be asked at every stage in the litigation process. Well, that's a fascinating take. And then, um, yo, uh, Walter, I'll go to you and um, Professor Pillas and other people have certainly touched on this, that, you know, Justice Brandeis coined the phrase laboratories of democracy in terms of how federalism works. But as we've discussed a lot through this panel, state election laws, including redistricting, 
are something where both sides have issues with how it's done. And, um, you know, as we've discussed and um, Kevin and other people just raised, you know, we've had the Supreme Court and um, conservatives there, Republicans want the Supreme Court to intervene on um, certain state Supreme Court decisions. And um, other um, people um, might um, want a national standard, particularly on um, Democrats. And, um, where, um, and when looking at all of these, you know, how this all plays out, is redistricting and potentially other areas around election law or process just an area where federalism doesn't work? Well, you know how to get a rise out of me if you say is is isn't the answer that federalism doesn't work. Uh, I will say <clears throat> I am not a Democrat, but I uh, very much would um, uh, support much of what uh, Professor Pildes was saying about uh, the oddity of not having a national standard for the U.S. House of Representatives. You know, leave aside the question of whether state legislatures should be districting themselves by some nationally uniform standard w- for which there's a less, much less good case. But there is a good case that the U.S. House, um, uh, not only uh, as a matter of good policy, but also as a matter of constitutional um, uh, plan because Congress was specifically given power to regulate the um, uh, House elections. And I agree, if the Supreme Court is not going to act, I agree that legislation from Congress uh, prescribing uniform methods to curb gerrymandering uh, would be very much a, a good order of business. I hope that uh, we can get some sort of centrist coalition going to get those national standards for the House. Now, that doesn't solve the problem in principle because you've got the state legislatures where Congress has, does not have an enumerated power to clean that part of it up. But at least it would get us some progress in the House. And on, on the federalism issue, just to de- de- desperately defend federalism against whatever detractors there may be in the audience, the, um, the Constitution is quite complicated in how it handles these things. It treats, as we remember, Senate elections differently, and then it had to change that. Uh, It treats presidential elector uh, elections quite differently, and the powers that states have are quite different than for House seats. And there is, I believe, a rationale behind all of this. It doesn't consist of give the states all the power. It doesn't consist of take all the power away from the states. It instead uh, is carefully calibrated to the different kinds of office uh, that the states might want to have a say on. I I think it's also worth pointing out for national elections, like for the House and the Senate and the presidency, um, I'm not sure if we were creating the system on a blank slate that we would have that process so regulated at the state level as opposed to having national standards for national elections. Now, the Constitution certainly contemplates Congress passing legislation, you know, it it permits Congress to legislate the rules for national elections. Um, But the truth is, um, I think mostly because of the path dependency of of how our system was, you know, born and the primary role being played by the states for so many generations in regulating even national elections, um, we don't have much in the way of national legislation for national elections. For example, on issues like do we have early voting? Do we have absentee voting? Under what conditions? Uh, when do ballots have to come in to be valid votes? Those kinds of questions. Um, I think in theory, you know, it, it, if we could get to some kind of compromise on some of these issues, if you had national legislation, it would provide a much more stable framework for national elections because it takes a tremendous amount of consensus to get something established at the national level. And then because it takes that level of consensus and you have bicameralism and you have separation of powers and different election cycles for the different branches of the national government, it's very hard to undo it. So what we're having right now go on in the states, even with respect to the regulation of national elections, is that we're having this back and forth as different parties gain power or lose power Um, You know, we have these continual voting wars over the rules for our elections. That very instability isn't very healthy for the system. 
Uh, and in some of these contexts, it's more important that there be a clear rule that's settled in advance and not constantly changing from election to election. So at least for national elections, there, there are good reasons in theory to think we would be better off with some amount of national standards, but it's just very, very hard to get there at this point in time. Um, and, and that's what leads to um, what we're seeing right now, which is a lot of this back and forth uh, changing the rules from election to election as different forces gain political power in different um, states. Ah, very interesting. Kevin, what do you think? My first comment on this is that, that I think that you can't really divorce election administration at the state and the, fe- and the federal level. I mean, the, the first point that Professor Pildes made, and I, I think it was the first point that Professor Pildes made, and I think that uh, um, um, Professor Olson also made this point, which is that, look, the vast majority of elections that are conducted by the states are for state offices and for state office holders or for local office holders. Uh, and whenever, and this is my, now I come in with my opinion, and whenever the federal government starts to, to, to try to get involved in that, there are some significant issues uh, that deal whether it's whether it's comedy, which is from the nature of, I, I wouldn't agree with Justice Brandeis in, in the idea that federalism exists to, to come up with new ideas. Federalism exists because states retain uh, sovereignty, at least to the extent that it's not delegated in the U.S. Constitution. And there's nothing more essential to that sovereignty than the ability to, to uh, elect, uh, to, to be able to have set the rules by which the government is going to get populated. So if we recognize that as a value, one of the problems, I think, with national standards on different uh, for different things is that those national standards are almost certainly going to affect uh, individual day elections and the processes at those elections that are actually going to, that are just about state officers. It's almost like um, you're going to have to accommodate the elephant, uh, even though uh, even though you know you you really just you know the state just needs to take care of some foxes or something like that. That might be a, a terrible analogy, but but I don't think you should overlook that when the federal government gets involved in one area, it's going to come through the rest. Uh, the rest of the areas, and it's going to create some tension with what I think most of us would agree uh, would ultimately be a a state responsibility. I'm not going to get into the political gerrymandering or partisan gerrymandering um, comments uh, at the moment, but I did want to kind of flip the question because the question was, you know, if states basically have shown that they can't run this, and I just want to, what has the federal government done to show that it can run elections? In the redistricting context, for example, just just this 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 term, like what, what's the federal government's number one responsibility when it comes to redistricting? Getting the U.S. Census done and performed, right? And they they missed their deadline of reporting information to the states by what four months, four and a half months. This is when we already have a compressed deadline uh, to go ahead. You know, in terms of if there's going to be litigation before the first election. Uh, that's unconscionable what they did. And beyond that, they didn't even give real numbers, right? They said, we're, we're going to perturb our statistics. So you don't actually know where the people live. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, whatever, that they have, it was only done to a certain uh, degree. And, and there is a certain fiction in one person, one vote insofar as you know, where people lived on April 1, 2020 is not where they live on the first election. But uh, you know, I consider that to be an enormous and a gigantic fail that a state legislature or any party interested in redistricting didn't even have any uh, information from the U.S. Census about where people actually lived. And if we go and uh, pull back from beyond this election term, let's look at other areas where the federal government got involved in redistricting. I think, you know, the, the number one thing that comes to mind would be Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And I don't want to talk about uh, the, the policy. I think the policy was of the Voting Rights Act was extremely important when it was what it was passed. I just want to talk about the mechanics of it. If anyone was involved in the process of getting preclearance from the Department of Justice, I don't think that they would report that they thought that the Department of Justice was an even handed player. It was predictable in its responses and what its responses were going to be, you know, had some kind of, you know, um, even credibility uh, with with the applicants uh, in so that far as that they could rely or trust upon what DOJ uh, was doing in that preclearance process. And so the idea that we would go ahead and export 
all of our election administration to the federal government, uh, whether it's in redistricting or other parts of election law, I think uh, you know that that introduces a much larger risk of catastrophic failure than the current system where, where yeah, we have uh, fights and things change uh, in individual states. There are problems with individual state laws or opportunities to experiment with an election law that ultimately uh, get adopted by others. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but I don't think that it has the same uh, capacity to, to uh, be captured or to have a catastrophic failure. Can I respond to that? Um, so, first of all, I, I think the recent census is not really a very good example because we were dealing with a pandemic. I mean, the U.S. government has conducted a national census in 1790 every decade, and the particular problems that happened this year with the delay, which is part of why we have such a mess in the courts at this point, because everything was pushed back, it, it is a result of the pandemic. So I, I would just put that peculiar one to the side. But but look, the national government has legislated in various ways with respect to national elections. Um, the reason all our members of Congress are elected from single member districts is because there's a national law that was passed to require that. And what was the situation before we had a uniform national law? We had exactly what's going on now on other issues in the states. We had the states going back and forth between whether they would use at-large elections to elect everybody to Congress from their state, from the entire state with a single majority deciding all the seats, or whether they would use individual districts. And this was a subject of constant partisan conflict. When different parties got control of different states, they changed the structure. It was an incredibly unhealthy dynamic. Congress stepped in and created the rule that you must use single member districts. We're better off having a clear, uniform, consistent, stable structure for that. Congress after the 2000 election, where we discovered all of these problems with some of the machinery for tabulating votes, stepped in with the Help America Vote Act. And the Help America Vote Act did a couple of very significant things. One thing it did is it required states to get rid of certain lousy technologies for counting votes, these punch card systems. It provided money and resources for that. And it required the voter registration process to be moved up and conducted at the state level rather than at the county level. That created a much greater, um, a, a much better system for voter registration, more transparent, uh, more um, regular. Uh, consistency statewide. Uh, Congress created the system of provisional balloting. If people show up at the polls and there's disputes about whether they're properly registered to vote or not, instead of having big disputes at the polls or turning people away who are actually eligible, uh, you now have the right to cast a provisional ballot. And if you're eligible, that ballot will be counted. So I, I agree. I'm not looking to see Congress involved in the nuts and bolts administration of elections. Um, but we're talking about setting the rules. And uh, there are lots of areas that I think the states, sh you know, should still uh, be the primary line of authority for. I'm just trying to point out that there are benefits to having some consistent, uniform national rules for national elections. Uh, and we've seen that historically because Congress has, in fact, played that role. And I think most of these examples are pretty positive um, examples. So we have to debate particular issues and whether particular issues should be dealt with by national legislation or left to the states. But, but certainly we have a lot of historical experience of Congress creating a better system when it's actually formed the consensus to step in and do something. Now, it's very difficult to form that consensus today in the midst of the kind of toxic, uh, you know, political dynamics we have surrounding virtually every aspect of the voting system. Very interesting, um, Audrey. Do you have thoughts? Um, I I do absolutely. So I have spent. I I just wanted. I agree with Kevin overall and what he said. Um, but I do also agree with Professor Pildes. Um, I I think that like HAVA was a pretty good law. It did a lot of decent things. It helped our elections. Our elections are better overall because 
um, of that federal legislation. Um, although a lot of it, I will point out, was standards that the states could enact, didn't have to enact. Um, and I think something like that it would certainly be a good idea at this point if we wanted to do that. The problem is, um, like Professor said, it's it's very it's completely impossible to get a law like that passed right now. The the laws that the Democrats proposed this last uh, this last session were, you know, not not written with Republicans in in mind, and they were very much uh, one sided laws. And a lot of the things they did um, would have helped their party and not the other party. And so I think a federal law like that um, that's kind of taking over details of election cycles is very problematic. I've spent a lot of time in elections offices around the country watching the process, watching the elections happen. And, you know, states have different needs. Different, California is very different than Alaska. And those two states um, don't need their details of their elections to be exactly alike. Um, and if you have some standards in place that, you know, the federal government recommends and, and, and possibly funds, I think that's that's reasonable, but having having uh, the federal government take over elections is not a great idea. They're, as as Kevin said, they're not known for running things well. Um, and I would also say that you know to zoom out a little bit and take an example of why federalism is so important in the election arena because I think it is uniquely important in this area. Um, you know, you take the example of state redistricting commissions, and I think a lot of people on this this uh, panel would probably say they're a good idea, but they're very different in different states and, and they've been more effective in some states than other states. And we have a lot of new commissions this redistricting cycle and small differences in how they're set up have made a big impact on how functional they are. Um, does the legislature appoint them? Who has the ultimate say on the maps? How are these people chosen? Um, I, and I would be interested to hear how, you know, People think these things have gone over all with these commissions this year uh, and what would improve a commission when instituted. And, and I think um, there's there's been a push on the left to institute these commissions on the federal level and, and put them in all the states. And I feel like uh, not only is that a bad idea, but it's just so premature. We don't really know. We've had you know one cycle with a few states doing it, and now we have another cycle with a lot more states doing it. I think we we get a lot of information, and states can copy what worked, and they they can uh, reject those things that didn't work. And I think having that ability to do an election laws is very important. Wow, that's very interesting, and um, go um, yeah, definitely love to read more on that and. Going um, off um, your overall prediction, it ties into our last question, which I'll uh, get, have Kevin start off with is, I think in the general media, you know, mainstream media, um, so non-academic, um, that a lot of time redistricting's this thing that happens every 10 years. You know, right now we're seeing a lot of stories from major news outlets, but that's largely forgotten about. And certainly in the past, I think we're going to see even more that a that there can be mid-decade um, redistricting, but even if there isn't, that there's a lot that happens that leads up to the redistricting. You know, um, as I alluded to before, and we've all discussed, you know, Democrats over the last decade winning a lot of the state Supreme Courts, who controls the state legislature and who controls the governorship. And what I, that kind of relates to, or does relate to what I think we're going to potentially at least see in 2022 and 2024, and the respect that a lot of state Supreme Court seats and governorships and state legislatures and just about all the contentious states are up. And of course, it's impossible to predict who's going to win them, um, especially you know, the 2024 ones. But there is a chance that those could be one that, um, you know, there's going to be some bail initiatives like the ones in the um, Michigan Republicans are pushing on their independent um, redistricting mission. And 
So that makes me think that there's a good chance we could see mid-decade redistricting be a bigger thing than it's ever been um, before. Is that an accurate prediction? And if so, do you, what are the consequences of that? I think it is um, quite possible that you'll see uh, mid-decennial uh, redistricting. It'll depend on the state constitutions uh, and how the state constitutions have been interpreted as to whether state houses can be redistricted, uh, whether there's a one-shot and done um, rule or whether you can uh, do it multiple times. I think it, it, you know, it is interesting to think about what the effects are uh, when you get the redistricting in place. What are the policy effects? I think what we saw, uh, what we've seen in the last couple cycles, is that there has been this move to uh, to commissions or to uh, amendments or referendums to constitutions to put in um, uh, standards that might try to encourage competitiveness in districts, which is what Arizona does, or uh, partisan fairness, which is what some others do. I, I think we actually are at a time where we ought to kind of take a step back and say, well, we, now we've got these things which are going on. We really should examine, have they worked out the way that we wanted them to work out? Um, um, if they haven't, are there tweaks to be made? If they kind of sort of worked, uh, was that was that really worth the trade-off of taking redistricting out of the hands of electable and accountable people? You know, my, my personal view here is that I think there are so many re redistricting values that are in tension with one another um, that no matter what reforms you have or get adopted, it's sort of like a person like plopping down on a bean bag, right? The beans are still in the bag. There's just a different pressure point that's going to get put on uh, by those reforms. Um, you know, you want a competitive map, all of a sudden, you know, you have all the Arizona congressional districts going one way because you tried to make a competitive map. You have a partisan, uh, a fair a fair partisan map, maybe you have no competitive districts because really the parties want to make things as safe as possible. There isn't sort of an ideal system. So, you know, things will work out with sort of the give and take and the push and pull. But, but my second point is I hope that, that, uh, the political parties and interest groups and advocacy groups uh, don't buy into the idea that when there's a district, people are elected because that's not that's not true. And there's no doubt that redistricting will affect the field of battle, um, you know, in terms of where elections are are, are thought. But I, that field really changes through time, through a 10 year period. I mean, I think about my own state. In 2004, we had uh, Bush versus Kerry for the presidential election, and that was a tie in Wisconsin, a virtual tie, like a statistical tie, uh, but Kerry won. And in 2016, we had a statistical tie, uh, but Trump won. And yet, if you look at the returns from those elections and take some kind of a unit of geography, like a county, like the number of counties and where they were that Trump won was just vastly different than what Bush won. You know, I mean, California used to be a Republican state. There's all sorts of things that change in time. And it's important for parties to remember that, you know, they can't really take, quote unquote, their districts for granted. Um, and they shouldn't abandon the field of things that they don't think are their districts because constituencies are dynamic. And the other thing I think, you know, people really underappreciate that not all candidates are the same. Not all campaigns are the same. Um, I think that our common both academic discourse and also public discourse really understates um, sort of the dynamic nature of constituencies in both partisan affiliation or partisan lean. And I think it understates the availability of the personal vote to candidates. Um, uh, I, I also think that they, that everything, including partisan gerrymandering and the, and the analysis of partisan gerrymandering rests on this absolutely false premise that parties are not dynamic themselves, right? Um, and if that is true, that parties don't change to respond to constituencies, then there is a far greater problem for democracy than whether, uh, say, a redistricting map exhibits a partisan bias. So I think what's more fundamental is that maybe political parties should stop looking at the results of redistricting and start looking at their districts, right? And fashioning ways to recruit candidates that are gonna better reflect those districts. And I would think that, you know, this is going to create heterogeneity 
within the parties, much more than exists now. And and I don't know that that this creates a third party uh, ideal that that I, I think that that Mark would like to see. But I think that heterogeneity within the parties, having different districts that have different characteristics, ranging from competitive uh, to as red as can be to as blue as can be, especially when you're talking about legislative bodies that benefit from uh, different types of constituencies making up or candidates for reflecting different kinds of constituencies. I think that's a that's a welcome thing overall. Very interesting. Um, Walter, do you have something to add? Well, I just point out that leaving it to the legislators to draw their own districts is the most conflict of interest written system. Picking people at random from the public would um, uh, be at least better in avoiding that conflict of interest. I am very much with Audrey in saying that experience with citizen commissions has been so varied. Um, so many flaws have been found as uh, launches have been made of one scheme or another that it's very much a work in progress. We are learning more every cycle. And that's the last time that we should want to impose um, a standardization requiring all commissions to follow the same format. Um, we should instead welcome experimentation on that and a bunch of other issues to bring in what Professor Brown was saying. We've got these wider problems that go beyond gerrymandering and polarization uh, is very much uh, a part of that. Uh, let me put in a good word for ranked choice voting for final four, for final five. We haven't talked about primaries, um, but primaries probably more than redistricting itself um, are an engine of the polarization that we see in which there is no longer an overlap between the two parties in, in Congress. And um, that experimentation that I urge is especially urgent there. Let, let's um, remove the barriers for states to try uh, lots of different things, uh, whether it be European style PR, uh, the different styles of ranked choice voting, of which there are many. Um, we can't really go on uh, with the current rules, I think, when they're producing such bad results. I'm so glad Walter expanded our frame here a little bit because um, I very much agree with what he just said. Um, and if we step back uh, and, and think about the, the, the toxic nature of our political culture um, and the extreme polarization, um, there are some institutional design matters that, that may make that problem worse or could make it better if we made some changes there. I absolutely agree with Walter about the structure of primary elections. There's no question that the structure of primaries has turned out, at least in our context, to drive the parties to the extremes. Uh, that uh, incumbents are, are most worried about losing primaries, which usually means losing them to the ideological poles of their parties. To preempt that, they move to the extremes themselves. Um, I'm very much interested to see how the Alaska reform that voters adopted um, plays out this year uh, with the top four primary structure and then ranked choice voting in the general election. Um, I also want to relate this to gerrymandering, though, because we haven't quite touched on this. Um, but one of the major effects of this round of redistricting is to decimate the number of competitive districts in the U.S. House uh, from an already fairly low level. So we had about 15 to 17 percent of the seats being competitive seats uh, in the last decade. Uh, under these new maps, uh, it looks like it'll be under 10 percent, maybe seven or eight percent. And members in safe seats, which 90% of them are going to be in, um, all the more worry about just their primary election. There's very little accountability. There's very little likelihood they're going to be thrown out in a general election. And creating more competitive districts does generate incentives for candidates and office holders to have to reach out to the middle of the electorate. Um, to be more responsive to changes in preferences from um, election cycle to election cycle. So, you know, if voter preferences shift by three or four points in a competitive seat, that can mean that somebody else gets in that position. If you're in a safe seat where you're winning with 60% of the vote, you can lose 5%, 7 8 10% of the vote, and it makes no difference. Uh, so one of the things we do know about commission redistricted, and I agree with the comments that, um, you know, commissions vary and we have to get a better handle on which ones are working better and why. 
But in general, in the aggregate, uh, commissions produce uh, maps that tend to be more fair in terms of partisan outcomes than legislative maps drawn by uh, in states where one party controls. And they also tend to produce more competitive districts than maps drawn by legislatures. We actually had a great example of this in New York. When the Democratic gerrymander was enacted, there were only something like three districts that were going to be competitive districts. When the court struck down that plan and appointed a special master to draw the districts, um, there are going to now be something like eight districts that are competitive. I mean, a huge increase uh, in the percentage of competitive districts. Um, so uh, uh, I do think Walter's right that, that we need to be thinking sort of broadly about the institutional structures that we use and how much they're contributing to the extremism in our public political culture. Um, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of reforms that can help mitigate that extremism. Yeah, those are excellent points. And um, Professor Brown, um, do you have a take? Gosh, I think my take is we're, we're slapping Band-Aids on uh, bruises and cuts and we're treating symptoms instead of going after the disease itself. That's one thing we need to, I agree, we need experimentation, of course. Um, we need to keep trying and you know i think the the federalism approach works you know we've got 50 experiments going on so i, I agree with all that stuff but it seems to me that everybody's doing pretty much the same thing with not much variation i mean um, i mean commissions mixed bag of results i think that um, rick is right there has been some success there but but i also think rick you're overstating the success i haven't been nearly as impressed with um with the commission approach, the, the the judicial approach won't work either. In my opinion, because I just don't think judges are that different than commissioners, you know, and I think the statistics prove that. So I, again, I, I think we're by by attempting these um, solutions, uh, the ones that you see that are out there, we're, we're we're not getting at the root of the problem. I think we have to go back even farther. And again, I and I. I think it is, and I said it before. You know, you, you've got to make ballot access more, um, more real and less fiction. And that's what, we don't have that. The two parties control the ballots. They they control the primaries. They control, you know, who runs, and which means you're going to have polarization. Once you've got polarization, whether you use a commission or a court or anything else, it's going to be a big gerrymander problem. It's it's not going to solve um, itself. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, thank, all, thank you all for joining us. It's been a very productive conversation. We really appreciate you all giving your time and expertise. Thank you.